Are we good? Yes, I think we're good. Okay, excellent. Um, um, hello, everyone. Uh, should we just wait two minutes? Yeah, we the participants are still joining. Oh, are they? Okay. Yeah, so let's yeah. just wait a minute. We can wait. I think we have like twenty-seven attendees. Yeah. yeah. So maybe you can begin in like a minute. That sounds good. Is everyone completely swarmed with Zoom meetings? Mm, yes. Well, I'm on annual leave, so um, it's good. So it's been a break, which has been nice. Yeah. Thank you for joining us in the middle of your annual leave. Sorry. Well, but I mean, if this was a real summer, then I would have been out in London making friends. So this is the closest. <laughs> <laughs> like just sort of, yeah. Because I don't really know anyone in the city, and so yeah. it's nice mm. to break up annual leave with human contact. <laughs> mm. That's what mm. human contact looks like right now, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps we should begin. I, I'm assuming more. Yeah, people I would, yeah. I think let's start and people might trickle in for a while more. Yeah. 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 Sounds good. Okay. Excellent. So welcome to the second installment of our South Asia from Afar webinar series. Um, as most of you know, I'm Sneha Krishnan and I'm an associate professor in human geography here at Oxford. And I'm hosting this series with Monica Mathur, who's also an associate professor but in anthropology of, of South Asia. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce our series to anyone who didn't make it to the first session and also introduce our speakers. So the series was prompted by Nanikas and my wanting to comment on the panic that seemed to be running through all of us scholars of South Asia located in the UK, but also people in Europe and North America, um, that this summer they couldn't kind of make the usual annual trip to the region because of COVID-19. But at the same time, we'd also been thinking a bit about how the pandemic is only the last of many impediments kind of to academia as usual. Um, Right-wing regimes everywhere, both here and in South Asia, are changing the way that people are able to travel and restricting what academics can really write about. Um, but AFAR is for us kind of only a generative jumping point. So we're hoping that in each webinar, our speakers will kind of bring their own reflections into what that means. So this week we have with us uh, Samia Khatun, Shantanu Das and Rahul Rao. So I'm going to introduce all three of them right now and then they'll speak in that order um, soon after. So Samia Khatun is a feminist historian who researches the life worlds of peoples colonized by the British Empire. Her first book, Australia Nama, the South Asian Odyssey in Australia was published in 2019 and it examined encounters between South Asian travelers and Australian Aboriginal peoples and the colonized knowledges that structure forgotten histories of the Indian Ocean, of Indian Ocean cosmopolitanism. She's working on a new project connecting ecological and economic histories of textile industries in the Bengal Delta. She recently moved from Dhaka to London and is senior lecturer at the Center for Gender Studies at SOAS. Rahul Rao is a senior lecturer in politics at SOAS University of London. He's the author of Out of Time, The Queer Politics of Postcoloniality, which came out this year, and of Third World Protest Between Home and the World, which came out in 2010, both published by Oxford University Press. He's a member of the Radical Philosophy Collective and blogs at The Disorder of Things. Shantanu Das is Senior Research Fellow and Professor of Modern Literature and Culture at All Souls College at, at Oxford. Um, his latest book, India, Empire, and the First World War and First World War Culture, Writings, Images, and Songs, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2018 and was awarded the Hindu Nonfiction Prize this year. Okay, um, so I think Samia is going to start us off then. Thank you. Neha and Nonika, uh, not only for inviting me to this thought-provoking series, but also opening a space for methodological reflections at this unusual time. I really enjoyed the first of the series um, a month ago. 
So um, as my uh, introduction said, I'm a historian of the British imperial world and having spent all my life to date in various colonial outposts, deciphering modes of historical storytelling that are articulated in various spoken tongues um, by South Asians as well as Aboriginal peoples in interior Australia. The recent move from Tartha to London about 10 months ago has got me trying to find my feet at what I'm experiencing as ground zero. I've been largely approaching Britain as a site that sort of not only ceded an empire, but did so through an entire edifice of Anglo-modern thought that relegates um, colonised people's intellectual traditions to the realm of subjugated knowledges, often banishing them to the realm of the home. Now, with all of us gathering here virtually from home, what I wanted to do today is offer some thoughts on what it might mean to do research and write histories of South Asia and its diasporas from home place. Um, now, home place is an epistemic site that Bell Hooks described in an essay written in the 1980s as a place that is pregnant with the possibility of resistance, renewal and recovery. And I'll come back to the concept of home place in a bit, but first I just want to highlight some of the intellectual and political challenges that this moment has generated um, for scholars, precisely as COVID has pushed us all to work from home. Now, undoubtedly, the pandemic has exacerbated to devastating effect the existing crises of racial capitalism. Um, in Bangladesh, for example, the ready-made garments industry stopped moving along the supply chains that hold in place the domination of the global south by the global north and millions of workers were left not only to earn, um, not only unable to earn a livelihood, but also without their wages in arrears. Now, at the other end of the supply chain, um, the weekend after George Floyd was murdered by police in Minnesota, the release of a report by Public Health England revealed in stark terms the classed and raced terms in which people are dying. Bangladeshis, for example, a very working class group of South Asians in the British context, were four times more likely to die than white Britons, as the uh, report showed. So it was against the backdrop of these very obvious racial disparities of COVID deaths that Black Lives Matter uh, movement took hold in Britain and elsewhere. So class, completely inextricable from race, emerges from this moment as one of the most violent ordering principles that's currently determining who lives and who dies. Now, when the statue of English merchant and slave trader Edward Colston was thrown into the river by Black Lives Matter's protesters at Bristol, I interpreted it as um, a two-part protest in, one, in some ways. Firstly, challenging the political economy of racial capitalism that has at its foundation the institution of slavery. But I also read it as a call for epistemic justice in a sense, a challenge to a historical narrative about empire that buttresses the contemporary murderous world order, which has at, it, at its very pinnacle um, the white male subject and the claim that this white male subject comprises the most advanced form of human being. Now, this is a truth claim that is at the foundations of almost every modern institution, I would, I would argue. Now, it's a juncture at which I think um, all of us working within the higher education sector are having to return to and with some urgency actually have a think about what the construction of the white masculine subject, um, what relationship um, our discipline has to the construction of that subject. Now, this is in some ways a project that was well underway with various decolonised the curriculum movements, etc. But in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and in the wake of things like, um, you know, there's a um, a group of students who are calling for a free black university and these renewed calls for epistemic justice. These are um, some of the, the backdrop that are going to, I think, uh, frame some, not just my comments right now, but I think um, projects to come for years, I hope. Now, I might as well state the basic premise that I'm working on here. Um, 
we, and by we, I'm actually talking now to researchers based in uh, university systems. We as researchers are primarily engaged in the invention of subjectivities. Our books, whether or not we are comfortable admitting it, are deeply entwined with the construction of the self. Now, those of us who are lucky enough to be waged in this terrible moment for higher education, also do this work of cultivating other subjectivities, the subjectivities of students and audiences in the classroom and through our books. Now, as I said, um, I, this is a moment where I think lots of people should be turning to re-examining the complicity of their disciplines in terms of um, these particular racial hierarchies. Now, historians have a very particular role that they have played in the construction of racial hierarchies, whether they were people who invented narratives of racial progress, they were certainly people who popularised um, um, narratives of racial progress to a pinnacle of white civilization. That, that was definite, uh, the history book and the historian played a key role in making that a narrative that was hegemonically understood to be true um, in colonial modernity. Now, for professional historians of all stripes, whether you agree with the critique that I'm putting forward of historians or not, for professional historians of all stripes, what COVID has meant is, of course, to stop us from physically getting to the archives. Now, in my particular case, I planned to head to the British Library, the SOAS Library, and then I was going to go to Bangladesh. And um, because I'm embarking on my second book project at the moment, and it's on 18th century South Asian labour. And I've gotten quite obsessed with the cultivation and production of a variety of cotton called Nurma. Now, literally translating to our light in Persian, Nurma is a strain of very fine cotton that supposedly became extinct in Bengal under East India Company rule. And I was supposed to test some of the very first ideas about the death of the Nurma uh, cotton variety at a conference in Melbourne this summer. Instead, of course, I've been here in Britain, somewhat forced to, you know, uh, prematurely make a home in this strange country. <laughs> and um, actually tomorrow, after months of closure, the British Library is actually opening 22nd of July, 11 a.m. However, I missed out on tickets for this first week. There are no more desks. They're releasing tickets every Thursday. So... In this lacuna, in this moment where I remain locked out of the library, the official library, I want to test the possibility of different modes of knowledge production that become available from what I called home place earlier, a, a term that Bell Hooks first um, thought and wrote about in the 1980s. Um, in Hooks's terms, uh, she wrote, historically, African-American people believe that the construction of a home place, however fragile and tenuous, whether it's the slave hut or the wooden shack, has a radical political dimension. Despite the brutal reality of racial apartheid of domination, one's home place was the site from which one could freely confront the issue of humanization where one could resist. Black women resisted by making homes where all black people could strive to be subjects and not objects. And um, it's a sort of, um, I guess I've been using this concept of home place as a tool as I try and shepherd my students through a moment where they're, they're thinking, what, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna think? How am I going to do my research? I've, I've turned them again and again to thinking about the epistemic ground that is home space. Now, I want to do a thought experiment with you for the brief remainder of my comments today. I want to share with you something of what it looks like for me to think from home place. And I think that it means something quite different for very different people. If I give up the game of trying to construct myself as a rational modern self that stands over others, sure of my epistemic superiority over all other sentient beings, whole range of thought becomes available to me. What kind of subjectivities can we construct from that kind of place is what I'm interested in exploring today. So what I want to share with you is actually a dream a dream of a library that I had <laughs> whilst in lockdown. So this dream, like many of my dreams, are in three scenes. Firstly, I'm in the British Library. 
daylight streams through the skylights above and the desks are beautiful with sort of leather inlaid. Uh, however, I haven't got a ticket. There are no free desks. So I'm going around and around looking for a desk. As I'm circulating the edges of the library, looking for a desk and also a book, I see a historian I know and admire, and they're sitting there reading intent on deciphering a text. And at a nearby table at the center of the reading room sits my friend Noor Sobers Khan. Now, many of you in this audience might know Noor. She's the lead curator of the South Asia collections at the British Library. But her and this historian are sort of engaged in that uh, act of looking at each other but researching in the way that everyone's doing in the British Library. They're all checking each other out really in quite an intense way. Watching all of this drama, I go to the main desk of the library to talk to the librarian. I can't find the book that I'm looking for. I'm looking for a book by the Australian historian Heather Goodall. It's titled Making Change Happen and it's a book about Kevin Cook. Now, Kevin Cook's an Australian Aboriginal activist and trade unionist, and he built um, an education, or he shaped a very important educational institution called Tranby Aboriginal College. It's an Aboriginal adult education um, institution. Now, the search for this particular book leads me out of the bright um, reading room, out past the desk and into the dark labyrinth that is the library, and I find myself outside and it's nighttime. Because it's night, I know that it must be Australia and because they're all asleep right now, for instance. <laughs> and it's a, there's a garage and it's closed and there's a booth by the garage and it's a ticket booth. I go there and buy a copy of Heather's book and when I buy it, the garage opens and inside is Kevin Cook and Heather Goodall, the author, engaged in a series of conversations and if you read this making change uh, happen book which and it's an incredible work of oral oral history it's about political conversations that happen around the kitchen table that end up coalescing into a book and it belongs in many ways to the subfield of aboriginal history which has done some very innovative work on oral history now as, it's, as I sit down and I know that it's connected to a larger discourse of oral Aboriginal knowledges that today are known as dreaming discourses. And there in the night in that garage, it's as if I'm listening to the book. Third and final scene in the dream. I'm in a fourth floor apartment in Dhaka in Bangladesh, which is where I was supposed to go. I'm in the dining room table in my family home, talking to my uncle. He's a television man, and founded Shomo Television, one of the main news channels in Bangladesh today. I tell him inside my dream that I'm engaged in the act of reading a Kwab Nama, the book of dreams. Now, some of you would know that a Kwab Nama is a genre of text that is uh, about dream interpretation. Um, my uncle is very intrigued, but extremely uncomfortable, even though dreams and dream interpretation is ubiquitously present in the extraordinarily rich oral archives of my extended family. I also come from the belly of secular Bangladesh. These people don't like to talk about dreams. In a post-1971 Bangladesh, the discourse of dreams and dream interpretation belongs to the Islamists. Now, despite his discomfort, I show him an image with a stick with a fire at its very end, almost like an incense stick. And it's an image in the book that I'm reading. The last thing I think before I wake up is, emitting light, this image detailed in the dream is a source of illumination. So wait, what's going on? <laughs> what is actually going on in this dream? Is it trying to tell me that enlightenment, just as enlightenment is a metaphor of light and knowing, that perhaps Nur, as in the very first uh, scene of the dream, is also a methodology via which we might know. Now, you'll remember that I said I was obsessed with this particular species of cotton called Norma. And ever since I've been obsessed with it, and actually for about a decade now, I've always dreamt of the concept of Nur, a very dense concept in South Asian intellectual history, actually. And since I became friends with Nur Sobers Khan, it's become really easy because she appears personified as Nur. Now, 
it's a dream that raises a range of different questions about how you do historical methodology. To me, it seems whatever I'm looking for, I'm not going to find the answer in that library. I have to go outside and it's in the world of oral history and it is the world in which I was trained, which is Aboriginal oral history. There I'm going to find something that will eventually lead me to Dhaka and be able to tell me how to move forward in this research. Now, in my first book, Australian Armour, I worked very heavily with Dream Archives and it takes me a very long time to use these types of texts and actually turn them into thought. So what I've shown you today is actually just the very beginning and as an invitation to think about what it looks like for different people to actually think from home space, not just to work from home, but to think from home space. I would like to propose to you that just like the British Library, this dream of mine points to another vast archive that historians can use and in a library of sorts. And I would like to propose and argue that if we are to truly decolonize subjectivities, decolonize the way that as scholars we are engaged in the production of subjectivities. It is to these inner libraries that we must turn or we cannot continue to pretend that inner libraries of knowledge don't exist. We cannot continue to subjugate them. Now I just want to end my comments with two sort of words of caution. I framed what I've said today very much drawing from concepts and thoughts that come from black thought and black feminist thought. Um, the what over 10 years of working cross culturally in historical production has taught me is that you have to work very, very, very hard so that these don't just become rhetorical flourishes. And in some ways, true solidarity across various different disciplines and also across different modalities of fighting racism actually only happens um, in praxis. Um, so a million years ago when I first started becoming a historian, I became very involved in um, um, violence in Australia, very involved in sort of um, in the aftermath of police deaths in custody. So it's with that spirit at this particular moment stuck in London that I've gone, tried to go to as many Black Lives Matter protests as possible. And I don't know what I'm doing and, I, and I'm going to get it wrong. I, I know because I, I got it wrong when I first got involved in Aboriginal things. But in the end, I ended up at South Asian history. <laughs> so I, I know from precedent that that is where I will end up. Second uh, word of caution I want to end on is my intention today is not in any way to conflate home place with the retreat into private property that is sort of marking the privileged experience of this moment of heightened border drawing. As in some ways, as we've started teaching online and started mining digitized archives, we've brought the difficulties of the higher education workplace and its epistemological framework into homes, effectively shrinking home place in the sense that bell hooks meant it. And I hardly need to sort of reiterate that it's long been a staple of feminist thought that the heteronormative household with the institution of marriage at its centre is one of the key sites of gendered violence. However, alongside these feminist critiques, the house has long, long, long been a motif for human subjectivity itself in not just feminist knowledge production, but also a very wide range of cultural histories. As COVID renders hyper-visible the racialized class hierarchies comprising the fault lines or underpinning the order of things, researchers who are working from home, I would propose, have much to gain from pausing to do robust thinking about the epistemic space of home. Thank you so much for that, Samia. Um, that was brilliant. Can we move on next uh, to Shantanu? Thanks. What a fantastic dream, Samia. I really envy you. Um, and many thanks, Sneha and Nanika, for inviting me and to all of those whom I can't see, but who's joining. Very many thanks. And Samia's last point about kind of thinking about uh, epistemology from home is also one of the running threads in my talk. But I thought I'd start with some images actually. So Nanika, can I have the first slide please? 
And I thought of starting with two photographs which are available online, but they're from the Imperial War Museum, both taken far away from home. The first had been taken in France, and on the left-hand side, it's taken in France, and the one on the right-hand side, it's taken in the Brighton Pavilion in England, and both involve touch and proximity. In the first image, a confident and uniformed white hand grasps and guides a colored hand. The caption says, as you can read, an Indian unable to read puts his thumb impression to get his pay. And I think under this touch is much of South Asian history with its various intersections of colonialism, class, and systemic inequalities. Now in the second one, you can see a wheelchair-bound man, injured, who reaches out to thank a scribe for writing a letter. Thank you, my friend, the hand seems to say, as the body fills in the gap left by language. These two men were part of the more than one million soldiers from undivided India who served in the First World War in places as the Western Front, Mesopotamia, Gallipoli, and East Africa. And I wanted to start with these two images to think about the concept of far awareness, because for me, my research on South Asia always had a far away quality because I was trained in English literature, not history. Second, the past is always a different country, especially when the subject does not even speak. The question of the subaltern is one of both silence and distance. Moreover, what I wanted to recover was not just what these men did, but how they thought and felt. I wanted to recover the sensuous texture of their experience and the underworld of feelings, a sort of intimate history from below. And there were two challenges I grappled with. First, how does one recover the histories of people who did not know how to read or write? Second, how does one make the past body of experience palpable in the present, registering, but also possibly going beyond the thicket of power, discourse, and representation? And for me, it involved a sort of three way process. First, a rethinking of what constitutes the archive, what questions we need to think of a new idea of this archive, and how do we read the material? Amnesia, I realized, is not absence while trying to do my research on these soldiers. And I realized that I had to move far beyond kind of national or even regional kind of official archives and include objects, images, paintings, photographs, sound recordings, oral storytelling, rumor, gossip, and actually a lot of dreams as well, and songs in order to understand these people. Because these men were non-literate, but also intensely literary, because they had grown up in the robust oral traditions, as kind of Samia pointed out, that kind of exists kind of across kind of different villages of Northern India. And I'll just take you through a couple of, kind of archival images. Nanika, can I have the next one, please? Thank you. So on the left-hand side, it's a pair of bloodstained and broken glasses I came across uh, in India. It belonged to a man called Jogen Sen, who was a resident of Chandanagar, a French colony. But he was reading, kind of he was studying at Leeds when the war broke out, and he was killed. And he was the first man of color in the Leeds Palace Battalion. And after he died, these glasses were sent to his widowed mother, who then gave it to kind of the Duple House in Chandanagar. I'm just kind of trying to trace out some of the entanglements. On the right hand side, it's a German helmet found with a Naga Battalion where they had put two horns and some hair on it. So there are all these multiple histories, and I would have time to go into them. And at the next slide, please. Again, 
on the left hand side an image again available online of the Indian sepoys and I wonder whether this picture belongs to the world of art or ethnology or a sort of homoerotic voyeurism. And on the right we have this kind of quite lovely portrait of this young soldier by the British painter Eric Kennington, painted in France, where the sepoy had actually written his name on the kind of signed his name on the left hand corner. And can I have the next, the final one, perhaps, Lanika? Thanks. And this is a kind of page from the diary or trench notebook of an Indian soldier, uh, Mir Mast, who defected onto the Germans. And when I came across it, it was in a sealed envelope. I thought that, you know, I kind of was kind of touched the heart of the sepoy and he deserted and then went on this extraordinary jihadist mission to Constantinople and then to Afghanistan. And I won't read out the words. You realize that what was on the minds of this 18 or 19 year olds in the trenches, he's trying to learn English and it's a full of kind of full list of anatomical parts. Now, does it show this kind of an incorrigible appetite for this man in all its obscenity and robustness for life, for bodies to come together? I wanted to kind of show this kind of couple of kind of archival kind of images because they are non-conventional archives. They are also these fugitive fragments evoke the sensuous body of history, the floatsam and jetsam of experience wrecked by the war and encode multiple narratives. But <clears throat> diverse sources do not necessarily mean decolonization. As for example, someone like, you know, Priti Patel is, I think for me, the greatest example that diversity does not mean decolonization. And de-Europeanization must extend itself as much to the methodology and the questions we ask of the material as to the material themselves. And this is where I think this concept of home or COVID time comes in, because I think it gives us a space, you know, to consider this material and ask us kind of what new questions can we think of them. Perspective and context change perception. While the archives remain vital, I think the distance that we have now may provide a space to rethink more fundamental questions of what constitutes the archive, whether we are fetishizing a particular kind of textual archive, how is the body of history made or unmade in the process of recovery, and at what point does interdisciplinarity become useful as a mode of thinking rather than just a general practice. And I think COVID has brought to the forefront two trends in recent years. First, a growing democratization of knowledge production and with it, a reconfiguration of intimacy. During 1914 and 1918, I was just amazed by the sheer volume of First World War stuff that was put online. Similarly, Things like FaceTime and WhatsApp have paved their way to these Zoom meetings where the so-called social distancing creates new communities and conversations. Now, most community buildings are based on some sort of exclusion, and I'm painfully kind of aware that a lot of people do not have access to online resources or to these kind of chats. At the same time, I think these chats also to join some people. And I think they are providing an important access to new communities. There are also possibilities of lateral conversations. Like for example, last week I was in a seminar where there's this kind of sustained conversation between historians in Delhi and in Senegal, which I haven't really kind of seen kind of much, maybe kind of swear would be one of the places that such conversations happen. So I think kind of these lateral conversations are also happening. Now for the last three months, we are inhabiting this strange paradox of becoming all to solid flesh in our fear of the pathogen while leading a largely disembodied social existence. We don't know when we'll be back home, when we'll get to see our kind of parents, 
those of kind of us whose parents are kind of live in India. And our bodies regularly are deprived of touch in regular kind of in daily contact. And I think the face on the screen and in reality is made to do the work of fingers as the smile is increasingly taking on the task of hugs or embraces. Now, I think that in many ways it reflects the gradual shift that had been happening over some time in our sensory relationship to archival material as we increasingly move from handling documents or objects towards an obsessively visual engagement as more and more documents are uploaded, like I spent years transcribing the censored letters in the British Library, and now they're all online. So almost like you know, six months were completely kind of wasted. Now I wonder whether it would result in a different, not just epistemological, but rather ontological relationship to the archive and its meanings. Attached by technology to our times, are we cutting off these archives from their own physicality? their iconic connection to the instant they preserve and testify to. So is there a certain kind of violence there as well? Second, what happens to the messiness, serendipity and chance, which is so much part of archival investigation, and also I think would be an important part for the work of the anthropologist. Now, <clears throat> For the last month, I've been editing kind of the Oxford book of colonial writings of the First World War against the backdrop of the British Lives Matter, a Black, sorry, Black Lives Matter movement. That was, <laughs> now both raised somewhat similar questions, whose histories get told, who does the telling, and how does one remember the contested past? We are also increasingly seeing different modes of narrating history, increasing use of literature, filling in the gaps in the archives, documentary, performance art, reenactment, sensuous immersion, and new forms of memorialization. I think COVID is a crack in the table of history when the whole idea of history is being challenged and reconceptualized. And I'll just give you one example. And I'm thinking of perhaps one of the most striking kind of monuments kind of, uh, to do with my research, which is the kind of gateway of India at Delhi. Now constructed by Luchens to commemorate the Indian dead in the First World War, is it now an imperial relic or is it a nationalist monument? Is it part of Luchens's Delhi? Or is it now for an imaginative community as one saw during the emergency? Is a plinth or a monument the best way to remember the past as opposed to exhibitions or books where more sources and narratives can speak to each other? Another question lurks within it. Why do we commemorate the heroic dead? Like in Oxford, for example, you know, there's a lot of kind of debate kind of happening about the road statue. I think in some ways it's too easy a target. In the context of India, is it possible to memorialize the Indian soldiers, whether in the first, whether kind of killed in the first world war or in subsequent wars, brutalizing enemies, kind of whether it be Germans, Turks, or kind of Pakistanis? Is it possible to recognize and remember them without endorsing their violent deeds or the values they believed in and fought for? And I think herein comes one of the kind of difficult moral rubs of doing history that when you are kind of so much enmeshed in the past, how can you disentangle kind of yourself from a sort of kind of sympathy? Kind of while recognizing kind of the moral stakes involved in this. So I'll kind of leave you there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Shantanu. That was really great. Um, can we move on to Rahul now? Thank you. Thanks. Um, 
Thanks very much, uh, Sneha and Nayanika, for this uh, wonderful invitation. It's great to be in dialogue with you and with Samya and Shantanu. Uh, I feel like a bit of an interloper in this conversation, uh, in part because I've never thought of myself as a South Asianist. Maybe we can discuss what, what that word means and what it might mean to call oneself that. I take it as um, the kind of scholar for whom South Asia is a primary field or arena of study. Uh, but having said that, my work has always taken South Asia as a point of reference and uh, tried to place it in conversation with other places around the question that I'm writing about at any given time. So I want to maybe just talk about four writing projects in which that has happened, not as a kind of uh, planned project, but um, South Asia has kind of reared its head in, in, in some of the work that I've done in, in ways that I found slightly unexpected. So in my first book, uh, Third World Protest Between Home and the World, which came out in 2010, uh, I was trying to do this work of putting South Asia, India, I should say, more specifically, because I write about India rather than South Asia as a region, um, try to put thinkers and movements in India in conversation with anti-colonial, anti-globalization, and queer thinkers and movements. And the particular question that that book is structured around is, the relationship between cosmopolitanism and nationalism in the thinking and praxis of movements, not as the kind of polar oppositions that political theorists often construe these positions to be, mm -hmm. but as normative worldviews that are often pressed into service simultaneously to do different kinds of work. And in, in each of the chapters in that book, I, in retrospect, I realized that I seem to come at South Asia via something or someone else. So, in thinking about nationalism, for example, I was drawn first of all to the work of Edward Said and to the curious paradox of both his participation in a national movement, uh, but also his critique of nationalism as a discourse of liberation. And uh, ironically, it was Said who led me to Tagore, who I end up studying and reading in that chapter in much greater depth. Uh, in a chapter on anti-globalization movements, I was very much taken up by the Zapatistas and anarchist groups like People's Global Action. And reading about them, I realized to my astonishment that the Karnataka Raja Raita Sangha, which is the Karnataka State Farmers Association, was being hailed by movements halfway across the world as the face of anti-globalization in India at that time, in the late 1990s. Now, I should not have been surprised because as somebody who grew up in Bangalore, who is well aware of for example, the, the fierce kind of cultural protests around the advent of the Dunkel draft and the first signs of neoliberal globalization in the form of you know, restaurants like KFC, which famously in Bangalore needed police protection for one year because of the an antipathy that they aroused among farmers' movements. I should not have been surprised that movements like this were being seen as the face of anti-globalization. Uh, and yet, it for a range of reasons, which I'll try to unpack, uh, it was this international hailing that almost alerted me to things that were going on right in the place that I was from. And this makes me think about home place um, a lot, uh, the, which Samia was trying to get us to think about. I think the experience of being wrenched from home place is um, obviously a very destabilizing one for many people. I think of Saeed's reflections on exile as, as a kind of um, emblematic statement of the productive as well as the painful consequences of that kind of wrenching. But I also think that if you are in the position of the master in home place, it might require a process of dislocation in order to see that home place differently. And so I, I'm almost confessing this, I think, in a, in a slightly, in a moment of uh, cringeworthy self-recognition. Uh, in some ways, this is not that different from, you know, Savarna voices hailing Black Lives Matter, but feeling unable to see or say that Dalit Lives Matter until it comes back to them via this kind of international reference. Um, so I just want to offer that as one way in which one might see South Asia differently from afar. And perhaps this is something we can talk about, both the uncomfortable as well as the potentially productive dimensions of being away um, and, and how that might shape our own work. Um, 
I try to be more self-conscious about questions of positionality and about how I come to things uh, in my second book, which has just come out, Out of Time, The Queer Politics of Postcoloniality. Uh, as the title suggests, this is very much a book about uh, post uh, queer struggles in the global south, and um, Uganda is very central to this book. Um, to say a little bit about how I came to this, um, I was very peripherally connected to the struggle against Section 377, partly just by virtue of being a student at National Law School of India University in Bangalore. Many of the leading lawyers in that campaign come from NLS or have some connection to it, um, although not limited to that university. It was the first, one of the first universities at which uh, seminars on gay rights were being held in the late 90s, for example. Um, I'd been invited to write about global queer discourses by the collective that produced the book uh, Law Like Love, which is mostly focused in Alternative Law Forum in Bangalore. But um, a lot of people were writing about Section 377, and also the Indian struggle struck me as a relatively national story, even if shaped by global discourses around modernity, health, human rights, and so forth. Um, Rahul, we've lost you. We can't oh, hear you. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, we can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, I don't know how much you lost, but just to, in, in contrast to the Indian struggle, which seemed uh, a relatively nationally circumscribed one, the furor over the Ugandan Anti-Homosexuality Act, right from its inception in 2009, was a very global story. Um, the reasons for this are not hard to see. As a weaker, more aid-dependent state, Uganda had been less able to resist foreign incursion, whether in the form of anti-queer U.S. evangelical Christian activists, or on the other side of the debate, international LGBT solidarity actors, some of which, some of whom were quite imperialist in the ways in which they performed that solidarity. So as an international relations theorist, I found myself drawn to the Ugandan story. Nonetheless, India and South Asia were never far away in my work in relation to Uganda. First, in my own identity and positionality. I, often engaged with my Ugandan interlocutors as a citizen of another former British colony that was also grappling with the entanglements of gender, sexuality, and imperialism. But my presence in Uganda was not always perceived in this way. I was often read as a scholar from the UK. Uh, sometimes I was racialized as Muzungu, which is usually a term used for white people rather than Muyindi. And I think by virtue of the questions I was asking about this thing we call sexuality, um, I, I was sort of marked out as Western and sometimes even as, as, as white, which I found very odd, but uh, it was a distinctly unsettling moment, which I write about briefly at the start of the book. I also found that South Asia was never far away in my theoretical apparatus. I suddenly became acutely conscious of the overwhelming South Asian presence in post-colonial theory, and I found myself having to keep in check my reliance on Baba, Spivak, Chatterjee, Chakrabarti, and to think much more about and with uh, Tamale, Nyanzi, Nanyonga, Tamasuza, Mamdani, Mbembe, Macharya. Um, India does enter the book, in, and it, uh, an entire chapter is, is centered very much around India, but I didn't want to write about Section 377, partly because many people had already done this. I wasn't sure I'd have anything original to say. So I chose to write about NALSA, which is the Supreme Court judgment that uh, focuses on trans rights. And I was especially interested in the trans community's use of backwardness arguments to advance recognition and redistribution demands. And so the chapter becomes about reading trans politics through an Ambedkar right lens and also retrospectively reading Ambedkar through a queer lens. My sources for this kind of work ended up being primarily literary. Uh, I was very interested in autobiography and life writing uh, by trans and hijra authors, uh, more so in autobiography than in ethnography. Uh, I, I was trying, I think, to complicate the distinction between the two, to see autobiography as a kind of insider ethnography. And I think I preferred reading autobiography because uh, I felt that these were narratives telling stories of dynamism and change within trans and hijra communities rather than offering relatively static, episodic, snapshot, thick descriptions of a community at a particular juncture in time, which I think anthropological work can be very good at. The only exception to this in that chapter is a reading of Arundhati Roy's The Ministry of Utmost Happiness, 
where I became very interested in the question of why the Hijra character Anjum functions as a kind of central node around whom the nation's fragments cohere. So the sources for that chapter end up being uh, literary, autobiographical, uh, life writing rather than discourse. Well, there's also some elements of discourse analysis, but rather than a kind of ethnographic work in which I position myself as an ethnographer. More recently, I have begun to write uh, more directly about India, not in comparison, but in, for its own sake and in its own right. And for me, the moment where um, this became inescapable was in the controversies around the Citizenship Amendment Act. We are still living in that controversy. So this is the moment of the now, which very quickly also becomes about COVID. And there is a strange interaction, of course, between the CAA and COVID and the lockdowns and the protests and the conditions that are imposed on us as citizens and as scholars by the conjunction of these two gigantic events. When writing about the Citizenship Amendment Act, I found myself relying on social media a lot, more than I have ever done, I think, in, in any other previous project. And this was a conjunction of a number of factors. Partly I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Partly the story was so vast that I would have had to rely on social media even if I was in India to access, say, you know, if I was in Bangalore to access what was happening in Delhi or uh, UP or somewhere else, I would have relied on social media. Partly because so. Raul, you're gone again. I'm so sorry. No. Nope. Okay, can't hear you, but all right. I'm going to try and move. Yeah, that worked. Is this better? Yeah, yeah. that's definitely okay. better. Let me, let me sit here. Sure. Oops, you can't see my face. <laughs> Maybe this is better. Yeah, we can see you yeah. and hear you now. Okay. Um, I guess I was just talking about the, the reliance on social media and writing about the Citizenship Amendment Act. Um, and, you know, I was saying partly it was being in the wrong place at the wrong time, partly it was because the story was so vast that wherever one was, even if in South Asia or India, one would have been looking at social media. Partly it was because so much of the politics of belonging and unbelonging was unfolding on social media. It wasn't just a medium, it was also the terrain on which the struggle was unfolding. Sometimes it was also the prize for which we were all competing in, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the politics of competing hashtags, for example, and what was trending and so forth. Uh, more recently, I was talking to Vidya Krishnan, who's been covering COVID for Caravan magazine. And she mentioned that under lockdown, journalists in India are subject to some of the same constraints as those of us who are writing from further away for different reasons. Um, many of her sources at that time when we spoke, which was several months ago, uh, she'd had to contact, um, you know, from home and, and had to rely on an interview from, from where she was. Um, but obviously this also raises questions about what we miss in relying on social media. What kinds of people, audiences, issues, arguments, concerns are not reflected on, on that terrain, however important they might be. Uh, and I guess finally, I'll just say something about what I've been trying to work on more recently, which is the politics of controversial statues. And uh, although many of these stories have been unfolding in the US, UK, Africa, in some ways, I think India offers a really interesting place in which to think about these questions, in some ways, because the statue wars are well advanced in India. Many of the things that happen elsewhere have already, in a sense, happened in India. Uh, competitive rival statue building projects, demolition, construction on an epic scale, um, which um, I think demands to be put into conversation with the politics of iconographic decolonization happening elsewhere. And that's what I'm trying to do now. And I find this work very difficult to do from afar because you know, I yearn to see the statues themselves. I want to investigate people's affective experiences of those statues. I want to confront the full force of their materiality and their size and the, 
you know, the effect they have on places and people in terms of displacement, in terms of, you know, the sheer awe-inspiring scale of what's going on. Um, and that's very difficult to do from afar. So perhaps we can also open up questions about what it is not possible to do from afar um, in this conversation. I hope you got most of that, but I'll, I'll stop here and I'll move back to my original place in the hope that the connection lasts. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rahul, and thank you, everyone. Um, so if any of our attendees have questions, could you please put it into the Q&A and um, we'll read out as many questions as we can. Um, and uh, I'm now going to hand over to Nainika. I'm also really conscious that we're actually technically kind of close to the end. So if everyone's OK with it, we'll run over just a little bit um, so that we can take a few questions, if that's OK. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks. I'm not going to take much time uh, because I, I would like to open it up to a Q&A. Um, but firstly, thank you so much, Samya, Shantanu and Rahul for these incredible talks. They were so incredibly rich. Um, now, just as Neha and I had sort of anticipated, we can see some really interesting overlaps in your thinking, in your books, in your writing. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just um, talk about a few points that uh, to me seem to uh, converge across your talks, uh, just to sort of open up a discussion. Discussion. So I think one of the ways in which, um, especially Shantanu and um, Samya are very much in conversation is really with this question of what the archive is, right? So if you're thinking about this panicky moment that we're in right now, something that has um, sort of you know, upset a lot of people is the fact that you can't get into the BL or you can't go to India and enter the National Archives or wherever you want to go. Um, what is so fascinating, uh, Samia, in your book, as well as in what you said, and Shantanu's work as well, is that actually you both have been reconstituting what this idea of the archive is from well before in your writing and in the way in which you understand it. Um, whether this is through, uh, and you know, this movement away from what is considered the official archive, uh, whether this is through a focus on Aboriginal oral histories, on dreams, uh, on music, on diaries, on, you know, scraps or letters, on images, on songs, etc. Um, as well as this move towards the digitization of archives, this way in which you're sort of moving us beyond that moment of panic that COVID has led to by thinking in a longer, more complex way about how we write history and what constitutes the archive. Um, but the second thing which I found really um, interesting in this process of reconfiguring what the archive is, is how you manage to bring in a particular kind of intimacy to these histories, a kind of deeply affective telling of stories, um, which is actually not possible if you'd stuck to the official archive, um, these sort of dreary old historical habits in a way, the same dreary to me as an anthropologist at least. Um, I love the way you talk about time, about you know the past and the present. I love uh, the way you talked about things like touch and emotion and, um, the physicality of things, uh, the materiality of them, uh, you know, visuals, memories, etc. Um, Samia's dream was absolutely beautiful because I think through those three scenes that you walked us through, not only are these like deeply intimate sort of uh, renderings of your thinking, but also you sort of completely make us rethink what the archive is, right? Um, through these three dreams, dreamscapes. Um, and sort of linked to that was the third point on the space, which sort of configured, I think, in all three of your presentation, in your talks in really fascinating ways. Um, I think I, particularly interesting was the way in which Rahul talked about, uh, well, firstly, the point that you make that, you know, do we actually call ourselves South Asianists? I think this would be an interesting question for the whole panel, because everyone here, I think Shantanu has a similar ambivalence towards this category of being a South Asianist. I'd love to know what Samia thinks of that as well um, in her own work. But I think the way in which um, spaces sort of pop up, as you put it, Rahul, for you, the way in which you went looking for something else elsewhere, but India sort of pops up in these very, very interesting moments, whether it is through the idea of third world resistance, whether it is anti-globalization movements, whether it is uh, the statue wars, um, but also just epistemologically how India or South Asia or Bangladesh get configured in it. Um, Samia, of course, walked us through, you know, from the BL to Dhaka to Australia. Shantanu's work moves us from, you know, these little bits of letters or whatever he was looking at at the BL to like Indian sepoys in France and other parts of Europe um, in these really fascinating ways. Now, space also really came up across all three of your talks in this idea of the home place um, that Samia began with. Um, what does it mean? What? How do you constitute home? What does home mean in COVID times? What does it mean to sort of go back home 
uh, again, how uh, the point that Rahul made about how this international hailing of a place like India allows you to think of it as home. Um, I also really liked uh, the other thing which all three of you are doing quite differently is how, who is it that we think with? So it's not just what the archive is or how do you go there, but who is it that we're thinking with? Are these black feminist authors? Is this about original history? Is this, um, as, as Rahul talked about, how he was unsettled from his post-colonial theory to thinking through a very different set of scholars due to uh, the politics of location and where he was and the questions he was looking at over there. Um, I think the question of theory and you know what that how that sort of plays in with these reconstituted archives are also really interesting as well as the question of ethnography and literature and, and what can be gleaned from them. Uh, I, I did find it interesting that Shantanu is officially um, I think a English literature person, but his his work seems much more historical. And Rahul, the way you use literary sources, or Samia, the way in which you told stories or you narrate stories, these are all not sitting within tight disciplines. Um, you know, I think Shantanu is the only one who used the word interdisciplinarity. Um, but I think what all of you do in your own books, in your writing, and your thinking is something that really challenges this question of you know what is a particular discipline through which we approach something like South Asia. Um, I'm going to just end with the last thing I can't not say it given that you know I'm in Oxford right now um, is the way in which the way in which all of you referred in different ways um, um, to statues and um, memorials so you know Samia talked about Colston um, Shantanu talked about India Gate and Cecil Rhodes which is down the road from us and um, Rahul of course has written as well on uh, the Rhodes Must Fall uh, movement as well as you also sort of talked about the statue wars that you've been looking at in India right now. So I'm sort of going to end here. I don't really have a question. I just wanted to sort of think about how we can weave it. We can weave these three very different but really beautiful talks together. Um, uh, Sneha, do you want to, I think that we can see there's a question already for Samia. Uh, Sneha, you're muted. So sorry. <laughs> um, there's a couple of questions that have come up and why don't I just throw them out and um, perhaps you can all answer them and maybe we can conclude with that, um, you know, very unfortunately because we're a little bit over time. So an anonymous attendee says, um, for Samia Khatun, what makes the place you are in home, home place or a home space for research? Does it relate to the movement and economy of cotton with respect to Noor Ma's um, history in particular. Um, another anonymous attendee says for Shantanu Das, with respect to methods in cultivating more sensory readings of archives for their literariness instead of their literacy, for instance, is yours an excavation that searches for a kind of poetic justice? In the world, we see dismantling literally of heroes and who who, who and how do you um, choose the unheroic figures that the archive over determines? Do you let these images speak back to you or do you go looking for the ones that are striking in their literary evocations? I'm actually going to um, read one final question for Rahul as well. Um, women's writing as domestic and home places and necessarily political space from Bell Hooks highlights what you bring to light with Indian women being unaccountable to caste relations while supporting Black Lives Matter movements. Home place realization can offer a possibility of return or self-discovery in the healing of wounds. Does reading Ambedkar to, through a queer lens heal something with respect to colonialism and nationalisms? Okay. Um, so in any order, whichever one, one of you wants to speak first. Um, please go ahead. So yeah, I can really go on. Yeah. Go first. Um, so I guess that question actually um, in some ways dovetails nicely with this issue that you have raised in your comments, Anonika, about, uh, you know, which of us actually belong in South Asian studies. Um, I, I don't really... <laughs> I, I, I was a historian of South, South Asian diaspora, but I was actually an Australian historian and now I'm embarking on a new project. The, what has been really noticeable in terms of um, trying to find a home place to write from is the afar that I'm experiencing right now in response to this anonymous question is actually not in a far from South Asia. I'm very used to being a far from South Asia. I, I, I left when I was seven. I'm currently very much aware of just how far I am from Australia. The, the settler colonial epistemological ground is gone and it's very, very, very odd being in 
London because in Australia, you can point out with moral um, uprightness in some ways, problematically, that the moment that the very first foundation stone of the university is laid at the University of Sydney in 1857, it's an assertion of the superiority of the white man over Aboriginal people. And hence, the very uh, founding ground of colonial modernity, the idea that something exists beneath it that you can stand upon to come up with other modes of narrating history that don't follow into the traps of the racial logics of progress. All of that, the cosmopolitanism of Aboriginal intellectual thought and Aboriginal history is all right there beneath the ground. You can make a political argument for connecting to that and writing from there. In London, I don't even, I don't know where you write from. It's not what's beneath this. What it's, it's, this is where liberalism was invented. This is, this is, I'm not entirely sure what other form of cosmopolitanism you actually appeal to. So these thoughts, this project on Nurma in some ways is very much me trying to invent that ground, find that ground somehow. I know that the Nurma cotton is something that very much binds 18th century Bengal and 18th century London together. So this is a, a very interesting point to kind of um, enter into. But of course, what absolutely fascinates me about the Nurma cotton uh, species is that the culture of production around it is very much tied up with the concept of Noor and what happens if you actually start thinking with Noor? Is there a way of finding an epistemological ground that thinks with Noor? And can I find that even sitting here right now in London? And what what I did discover in Australia is you can you can do that. You can you can pick up a text and you can actually enter into its logic and actually see that wow. In London, there have been South Asians traveling with the idea of Noor for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so you can actually pick up that thread and think from that epistemological ground. So um, I, I guess for me, that's what makes a place home, the ability to connect to that ground that offers you an out from the traps of colonial modernity and its, and its particular modes of thinking that I would say are extraordinarily destructive for anyone who's um, anyone full stop. Uh, that's all I'll say. Thank you. Um, Shantanu or Rahul, does one of you have? Whoever. Rahul, do you want to go? Why don't you go? Then I'll come after sure. you. Yeah. Uh, if my uh, audio cuts off, just wave. Um, I guess I, I'm just looking at the question addressed to me. Um, I think home place realization, to use the terms of the question, can often be a very uncomfortable thing. And this is what I was trying to gesture at, that it can, it can, one can also become newly aware of the positions of dominance and privilege that one holds in the home place as a result of an experience of dislocation. I think before we can talk about things like healing, self-recovery, self-recovery, return, reconciliation, we often need these moments of discomfort and challenge. And that's what uh, movements, uh, anti-racist and anti-caste movements are trying to provoke uh, and trying to push us towards. Um, the, the reason that I'm thinking Ambedkar alongside trans narratives in the chapter that I mentioned is because I was trying to read the the trans analogy with backwardness in the Nalsa case as more than simply um, a tactical argument that seeks to avail of um, reservation or affirmative action provisions in the constitution and more to think of a convergence at the level of ideals between trans narratives of becoming as well as Ambedkarite narratives of the annihilation of caste to suggest that the convergence there is a, is a principled one based on ideas that resonate with each other rather than simply a tactical argument uh, in order to access representation or recognition in the eyes of the state. Um, so, so that's the kind of, I'm, I'm not sure I would call that healing 
or reconciliation necessarily. I think actually these are means for assertion, for provocation. Um, but that's the, that's the motivation for reading uh, Ambedkar through a queer lens and vice versa. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rahul. Um, Shantanu, do you want to come in? Yes. Uh, on the idea of home, uh, I, the only thing I'd say that I'm very, very grateful to have a home at this time when there are homeless people all around us. So my response is one of primarily of gratitude, I think. And also in connection to that, you know, the Black Lives Matter, I also, also think that it really kind of breaks my heart when I think of some of the poor white working class lives and how they are, you know, fallen by the wayside and in a way they are tapped into the whole kind of the nationalist way of thinking by the Tories. So that's a real problem, I think. And so this is something to think about, I think. I Meaning, I think one of the questions was, why was I interested in the soldiers? This is because you now I'm very interested in questions of class and how the working classes, like for example, for me, the Black Lives Matter moment was the moment of Windrush scandal, when so little was done and so little was heard about the poor working class kind of black people. So, and it was a similar impulse that when I thought, you know, there's something very beautiful that Rahul said when at the end he said he wants to see the statues, almost like trying to feel and touch the statues. And for me, since I'm not trained either in South Asia or history, what I wanted to do is to basically touch and feel the past. You know, the bodies of these kind of men and women kind of, who were kind of either kind of went to battle or kind of were left as widows. So it needed a lot of digging and delving, but also putting different bits of fragments, acknowledging the gaps, but also see the different meanings, you know, that pulsate within it. And for that, I must say, I did not just include bits of and pieces just by Indians. There are lots of bits and pieces by European artists, European writers, which I think are as tender, though enmeshed in structures of power, but they are also remarkably intimate. It's not just one axis. So that's all I would say. And I think excavation is exactly the word. In fact, it's the word I come to kind of again and again throughout the book. So thanks for that question. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we have another question, but actually I think I'm going to um, suggest that we conclude the session at this point because we're already, already about 12 minutes over and I don't want to keep anyone from doing anything else or just going off their computers um, as the case may be. Um, thank you so much to all three of you for participating. I feel like I have a lot of questions for all three of you and I'll probably email you at some point um, and we can all talk more about all of this stuff. Thank you again. Bye. And many thank thanks you. to Nayanika for that wonderful response. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for your amazing talks. I mean, these were just mind blowing. I'm going to be thinking about them for a while. So thank you so much for that. Thank and you. again, I think the point that a few of you made, you know, I think COVID is, I mean, in this moment, it's really great to be able to have these conversations and to actually meet all of you and have these amazing um, participants in this webinar. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.